Welcome to Bloomberg Business Week's Talks. Did the coronavirus shock steal retirement? I'm Pat Regnier, Bloomberg Business Week Finance Editor. Today, we'll discuss the impact of the pandemic and lockdown on retirement. We'll also be answering your questions. There's a questions window on the right side of your webcast console. If you're watching on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube, add your questions and comments. Please send them over as we're talking and keep them coming. I'm joined by Bloomberg News wealth reporters, Ben Steverman and Suzanne Woolley. I can tell you from personal experience, they're some of the uh, sharpest and most experienced reporters in the retirement game. Uh, thank you for joining us. Let's get started. You know, as I think about retirement and how it's been changing uh, with the pandemic, I think a lot about uh, my own parents, and I think a lot of us think about our families. Um, they've had their uh, retirement experience drastically changed by this. Uh, we're Zooming with them a lot, but they can't go out. Um, it's uh, hard for them to go to the grocery store. Uh, travel plans have gone away. They're not seeing family. Um, a lot of the ways that they were hoping to use their free time have been curtailed. Um, but Ben, you recently did a story on some of the more profound ways uh, that people are being affected, people who are already in retirement or near it, and how it, how the events of the last few months have drastically changed their plans. Can you talk a little bit about what you found? Yeah, so we, yeah, as you said, we're in the situation where you, older adults can't see their grandkids, but that they also have a lot of trouble going to work these days. And um, at the same time, we have a retirement system where we've shifted over the last 40 years from, from defined benefit pension plans where some of the risks in the system were shared and you had some insurance against risks that came along. You now have a system where one of these things comes along, these crises, and uh, the work a worker saving for retirement or retiree absorbs all that risk um, on them, their own shoulders um, at a time like this. And if you have if your timing is bad um, and you're retiring into a crisis like this, it can be really damaging for your for your retirement security. So what we did was looked at the retirement si system we have now and really the flaws that have been in it for a while, but now they're just completely exposed. And how really the, the foundation of uh, retire people's retirements right now, the only thing that hasn't been shaken by this is really social security. So you have even wealthy people um, that we talk to uh, love their social security. It's a great way to manage their risks. And it's this consistent income that's coming in no matter what's happening with it, with the stock market or the macro economy or the job market. So um, it, that's, that was the story we did. And uh, we came up, we found some, some, some really harrowing um, statistics about just how unprepared Americans are for retirement and how exposed they are to a crisis like this. Uh, let, let's put up some of those statistics. We we have a slide here. It's the generation slide um, that uh, sort of shows how people were looking as they as they came into this crisis. Ben, can we talk through a little bit of uh, what we're looking at? Um, this is sort of different uh, retirement cohorts on on the way to retirement. Yeah. So what this is looking at is different groups of people, different generations. Basically, it's um, the the baby boom split into a few different groups and then the generations before the baby boom through history. And we're looking at what were their retirement assets at in their early 50s. So when they were in their early 50s, how well prepared were they for retirement? And the black that you're seeing, that's their Social Security wealth. So the, sort of the implied amount of money they're going to get from Social Security. The purple is um, their uh, defined contribution wealth, which means their individual retirement accounts and their 401k plans. And then the green is their defined benefit pension plans. So it's no surprise you see that the green is, is declining as time goes on, that we've seen that shift um, into 401ks. The like really the right scary thing, like you might get with the phone, like if you work for the phone company for years and then you have a retirement as you, as you come out. Yeah. 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 And it actually shows that people who were born in the forties and in fifties still have a fair amount of defined mm -hmm. benefit uh, wealth to, to draw on. What we, what we've moved to though is younger baby boomers have almost no defined benefit pension plans, uh, wealth that they can bank on. And their 401k and IRA wealth has gone down. So 
somehow the longer you spend in this new system, this new 401k system, the less money we have. It, it, it doesn't seem to be, this system doesn't seem to be working. Why, why is that? That's a sort of surprising result that in a time that for the groups of people who actually had the most time in the 401k system, you would think that they would have had the most opportunity to build up wealth in the 401k uh, system. It's a really good question. Uh, I think there's probably a million, a bunch of different answers. I think one of the, the best ones is that people just can't save enough individually to um, protect themselves from the risk of retirement. And so people aren't saving enough um, and uh, they're not getting enough help from their employers to, to, to bulk up those plans and those savings as well. So mm -hmm. I think that, and the other one is, I think um, these early baby boomers, I mean, the, sort of the younger baby boomers were really hit hard by the great recession. Right. Um, and so in some ways this is less of a retirement problem than a career problem that people have a problem when they get into their fifties, uh, they may want to work, but they're not going to be, those careers aren't necessarily sustainable for the time that they need it they need in those prime saving years. And so they end up downshifting in their fifties and then living off savings or tapping social security early. And you know, that's a really, sorry, oh, I'm to, sorry. Sorry, I was just gonna sort of point out sort of the lack of growth in wage income for a long period. Um, mm -hmm. it's, the issue with not being able to contribute more to our 401ks is, is really a fundamental one. There just hasn't right. been the rise in income that we'd need to be able to afford that. I mean, that, that uh, gives me a chance to uh, uh, shift to you, Suzanne, um, because I think one of the things that you're seeing there is that a lot of retirement planning or a lot of retirement issues, they're not about what's happening to you when you're 65, but what's happening to you over uh, the course of your career. Uh, Suzanne has done a lot of reporting on uh, millennials and retirement. Uh, so I think, Suzanne, this is a, a good question that we got from Anna uh, that I'll, I'll direct to you. Um, do you feel that retirees have been more affected than younger people and why? Uh, and what should what should retirees do about it? But also maybe actually we can just talk about the differential impact of like this particular crisis on both retirees, but also Gen Xers and millennials who uh, are having their path to retirement um, dramatically altered. Yeah, there's so many impacts. I mean, with retirees, obviously they're hit harder because they have more money at risk. Um, mm -hmm. And but the issue is, you know, they have less time to recover, less earning power. You know how in personal financial advisors talk about thinking of yourself either as like a stock or a bond. And mm -hmm. when you're young, you're more of a stock, you have more earnings ahead of you, you can accumulate more. If you're in retirement or near retirement, you don't have that kind of earnings power and you don't have like a, I have a sister who's a tenured professor. She's a bond, right? She has, you know, ready, steady income coming in. Um, so retirees are in a, in a tough position. And when you're, the millennials also, you know, are in a, with this high unemployment and it sort of depends what we see in terms of when 401ks, we've seen some matches suspended and such and, if you're not in a retirement plan and a savings plan and you're not able to sort of see your money compounding and get the company match and maybe the same you know your career trajectory has been slowed mm -hmm. your your ability to build up that nest egg is being hurt in your early years and it's in those early years when it's so crucial to start saving however small so that you can see that money compound over time mm -hmm. Um, you know, that actually uh, uh, raises a, a good question that we got uh, from Ben. Um, uh, from the dot-com bubble to the 2008 recession to the to coronavirus, uh, people have just had these constant shocks in their careers. I mean, should young people start to plan around having, you know, severe work or financial disruptions uh, in, in their retirement planning? Uh, basically, every decade or so, it kind of seems like. I mean, I would say yes, because this is what we have been seeing. And the, the common wisdom we all get sort of lectured to about building up an emergency fund, you know, when you're young, three to six months, when you're older and you're in retirement of a couple of years. Um, and, you know, it feels like your parents are lecturing you. 
But a situation mm -hmm. like this shows how important it is. You know, also for, for older people, because you don't want to have to be selling stocks into a down market, especially if you're right. near retirement, you could sort of kneecap your future retirement by having to sell stocks at this point in time. You want to be able to tap that money um, to have the financial flexibility to pay any sort of, you know, immediate needs if you're laid off with, with cash and not have to tap into a retirement account early. Um, yeah, actually, let's uh, let's put up a slide that we have prepared uh, that uh, we called the um, timing risk uh, uh, slide. Uh, this actually shows something that I think is really important for people retiring at any age. Um, it pushes against a little bit the mantra that we hear that you know when you're investing in stocks, you're investing in stocks for the long run, so you don't have to worry about you know um, about what happens in the near term. And and one thing that I've found that, you know, a financial advisor who's trying to push you into a high stock portfolio, even at an older age, will say, well, we have very long life expectancies. You need to be in stocks for a very long time. Um, but uh, things actually can change pretty dramatically if you're near the point where uh, you have to start with withdrawing your money. And, and this chart shows um, kind of what that what that means. It means that like, uh, a, a shock to a shock in the stock market can actually have a pretty dramatic effect on your ability uh, to spend or to make your money last at any given um, amount of spending if it happens actually early in 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 your retirement. Um, uh, uh, ben, do we want to talk through the logic of this chart that we're showing people here and what it's what it's saying? Yeah, I think you're describing it pretty well, uh, but basically. There's a there's a rule of thumb called the four percent rule, which which is this idea that you if you withdraw you start when you retire you start with four percent of your portfolio and that can be your income. So if you're you have a million dollars in your four hundred one k, forty thousand dollars could come out, and then inflation adjusted going forward, you can continue to draw that forty thousand plus inflation over time. Um, the the uh, calculations here is by Morningstar, and they're sort of gaming out. Um, you know, how long will that money last? Um, wh and what are your chances of that money lasting through your retirement? And um, it, it, depending on when a huge stock market crash happens, 25% loss. If, if that loss happens at the very end of your retirement or near the end of retirement, your 30th year, you have a 75% of your ch percent chance of your la money lasting. If that's happening, Earlier in your retirement, you have a much less chance of being successful, meaning you have much less of a chance, um, much more of a chance that you're going to run out of money and you're going to be just living on Social Security and that's it. And Suzanne, let's talk about why that is. I mean, it's 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 sort of because in when 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 it happens early in your early in your retirement, you're kind of eating your seed corn, aren't you? Yeah, exactly. Um, you are because if you have to sort of use your if you have to sort of sell your equities at a low point then early on um it's very hard sort of mathematically to get back over the years to maybe the the amount that you had targeted for retirement um it's just a um it's called sequence of like you said sequence of return risk and when it comes on early in your retirement it can be pretty pretty deadly which is sort of going back to why you need to have a fair amount of, of cash saved um, and also the 4% rule is, you know, a little bit controversial anyway. Um, some people will say it really should be 3.5%. It really should be 3.2%. Um, some people take it as sort of orthodoxy, but it's really, um, it's, it, it's, you know, it's, um, it's not necessarily a rule that you should stick to um, if circumstances change. Sometimes people will consider taking a more dynamic approach and when the market's doing really well, maybe you take out a little more. And if the market isn't doing very well, then maybe you take out a little less and you sort of adjust your, you know, the income to your circumstances mm -hmm. and the market. I, I mean, a, a key thing to making a rule like that work is both um, sort of how the market is doing during your retirement, but it, it also has to do with kind of the uh, level of returns you can expect overall in your portfolio. And um, to, to talk specifically about what we're experiencing now, we've had a market shock, um, but we've also had a dramatic uh, Fed 
Fed reaction to, you know, to lower interest rates, provide liquidity in the bond market. It's been supportive of a situation that we've had for a long time, which is a very low interest rate environment. Um, and I think one of the things that people looking out for uh, retirement are asking, and we have a question from uh, Nick about this. Uh, he, uh, Nick asks, at age 80, uh, I have a balanced portfolio between equity, bonds, and alternative investments. Um, you know, does it make sense in, in this environment to go to pure safety with given, given the near zero returns that you're getting on, on pure safe investments? We actually just have a lot of questions from people about how do I think about and deal with the fact that like the returns that I can get on safe assets right now are looking very low. Yeah. Who wants to take that? <laughs> well, I, I, I will just take one part of it, which is that, um, I don't, I don't think this is a moment when anybody, I don't think it's a, the best idea right now to be panicking um, and to be making huge adjustments. If you have a plan uh, that you set out and you've talked with a financial advisor and it makes, it made sense to you two, two or three years ago, like there's really not a great reason now to be completely scrambling and doing something completely different. Um, in fact, if you really look at the stock market uh, right now, we, we've, we've come back quite a bit. Um, the economic damage is profound uh, of this crisis, but the stock market is basically trading where it was last summer. So mm -hmm. I, I don't think that's um, any cause of concern. I do think I, I'd love to hear you talk about it this, Pat, a little bit more. The low interest rates um, are, 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 uh, is, are going to be a huge challenge for retirees going forward. And, um, I, and I don't think there's an easy answer. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the things you have to think about with um, the low rates is that they don't only tell you about low rates on uh, on safe investments. I, I think one of the temptations is uh, that you think like, well, rates are low, and therefore I need to uh, take more risk. Um, you know, in 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 finance, sometimes people call this you know reaching for yield. Um, the, the, the thing that you want to think about is low rates on safe assets generally implies pretty low returns on every asset that you can get because everybody resets the prices. Um, everybody's doing what you're doing um, and they reset their prices on, on assets uh, uh, given that the return on, uh, that the safe return is low. So even, even stocks, you sort of see they get sort of inflated price earnings multiples and that generally implies a lower return in the future. So, you can you could shift money into stocks um, uh, and uh, to to capture more return, uh, but you you will be continuing to take on all the risk that you always would have been taking on uh, shifting to stocks. And there's no reason to uh, necessarily expect the 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 high level of return um, that uh, people often became accustomed to uh, with investing. It, it could happen. You could have. Uh, you know, stocks have, unlike bonds, have a, a huge kind of psychological component, um, and you can actually have elevated returns for a long time if, uh, uh, you know, lots and lots of people sort of join you in uh, deciding that they're, they're they're more tolerant of of the risk and are willing to pay high price earnings multiples. But, you know, your baseline assumption should be lower returns in stocks as well. Um, and so that kind of gets you back to where you started, which is that um, you have to start thinking a little bit about, you know, how much can I actually expect to be taking from any given amount of nest egg? How much do I need to be saving? Uh, I, I may need to be saving more than conventional uh, financial planning had told me I had to. I might have to work more um, uh, or I might uh, have to, um, uh, think about actually one thing that you can do that's that's proactive is at a time when all kinds of rates are looking low, it makes more sense than ever to uh, focus on things that you have a lot of control over. So if you're cutting down on your investment expenses, you can add a point, uh, a percentage point a year to your return pretty easily if you're just avoiding the most expensive funds. If you're smart about uh, you know, the tax planning with your portfolio, uh, th that can help you too, uh, minimizing uh, turnover. But I actually do think that kind of in a, in a low return environment, it's, it's probably important not only to talk about like the things that, um, th the things that put the onus on you, uh, we do have uh, 
kind of a safety net retirement system in this country, Social Security, Ben was talking about earlier. And we have a question from Jim about that. Um, what can be done to ensure the long-term viability of Social Security um, in order to maintain it uh, or expand it? Um, so I, I think let, let's just start by talking about like, you know, what is what is the sort of the the, the situation of Social Security and, and how, sh how should we think about it? I'll let either of you, either of you take it. <laughs> um, the big one. This is this is a controversial one, but I, I, the basically Social Security, because of the retirement of the baby boomers, Social Security is starting to go into a deficit where it's where the, the amount of money coming in from payroll taxes is um, is less than the cost of the program. Uh, the good news is that we've been saving for this for a long time, and so uh, there's this large trust fund sitting there, and that trust fund won't run out until the early uh, early 2030s. That's a projection. Really hard to make a projection, especially at a time like this, but at any time. Um, there's At that point, there will be a gap, maybe 25%, 20% in in the program where they, they won't have enough money coming in to cover the costs. Um, so what uh, has been on the table for a long time is either benefit cuts or tax increases that would cover that. Um, what, what will probably, what will almost certainly not happen is that retire social security will not go away. That's my view. And I think you guys agree. Um, it's just too important a program. It's, it is the, only thing that people are relying on when they can't work anymore in, in, in many, many cases. And so, um, and again, it's, it's something that's valuable even for people who save for retirement. So I, I don't think social security is going to go away. And if you, if you listen to Democrats talk, they're really talking about expanding social security and expanding payments. And that's mainly by raising taxes on upper income earners um, at a certain point. Um, people don't pay uh, need to pay social security taxes uh, well, above a certain income level they don't need to pay social security taxes so there's been a lot of talk about raising that cap or eliminating it entirely so what you mean there is that after a certain level the amount of your income that's subject to the payroll tax it's capped and then so like every yeah. dollar you earn above uh, above that amount uh generally isn't isn't taxed uh, for social security, but, but the, the idea is to, is to pull that up, is to pull that amount up to make higher, yeah. higher earners more, uh, so more available. 30 or something or 130 something, mm -hmm. I think cap around now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and the interesting thing on the Republican side is that Trump has made clear that it, when he was running for president in 2016, that he would not touch social security and in, on the debate stage, uh, of the Republicans, he was sort of the, one of the only people who's actually saying that. So uh, there is a sense that this Republican Party has shifted as well on, mm -hmm. on this issue. So there's kind of a lost appetite for the kind of Social Security reform that uh, that that uh, would would uh, would cut benefits at least uh, for anyone near retirement now. Um, although actually, I think it, it's always been the case. Every plan I've ever seen avoids cutting benefits for anybody um, in near retirement. I, 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 I always find that one of the ironies of these conversations is we say we have to save the system for the younger people. And usually the solution to that is to cut benefits for younger people now. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, so, so, that, so that really all you're doing um, with a lot of those programs, which, again, we haven't had any kind of serious discussion of for at least 15 years, um, has been to just. It, they've basically been exercises in lowering younger people's expectations about Social Security rather than actually um, changing uh, the amount of Social Security anybody who is collecting it or is near collecting it today, which, um, I, you know, I think I understand why that is, but it's often at tension with the rhetoric of this because, you know, you, you, uh, I, I can remember all the times that people have said in these discussions of Social Security, it's like, well, we older people have to step up and save the system for younger people. And as a Gen X or every plan I ever looked at was always, well, it kind of seems like what you're doing is you're actually cutting my benefits right now. <laughs> and just giving me instructions to save more. Yeah. It's also just like to one point, which is that social security is so especially crucial for women because mm -hmm. women live longer. They often spend on the assets sort of taking care of their 
husband or partner. And um, there's a lot of um, elderly women in America for whom Social Security is their only source of income. And mm-hmm. it's sort of there is sort of a gender gender issue in Social Security. Yeah, um, I, 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 I think that's I think that's really true. Um, and, you know, I also I also when I when I think about this, I think one thing that people uh, do a, in the press do a disservice on with Social Security is we, we tend to frame it in terms of the trust fund uh, and the trust fund can run out. But one thing that's interesting is sort of if you just look at it like big picture macroeconomically, um, the idea if if you just sort of assume like, is there actually enough money being produced in the economy? Uh, to pay for Social Security, that's there's usually a lot less pressure there. It's a self-funding mechanism, and the funding mechanism can run out. Um, the the question of whether how much of the economy Social Security would eat up is a different question. I, my one caution on that, I'd say, is right now I I don't know what the projections look like now. Now that we're looking at a dramatically um, affected affected economy, I think you know we're all just looking at a world where. On the one hand, people need safety nets more, and on the other hand, um, you know, uh, the the you know, uh, I, I don't know if we have the numbers in yet. But we're lo- we're probably looking at you know shrinking GDP, uh, and we don't and we and we don't know how how long uh, that that will that will last. Um, there are fewer people paying into Social Security right now. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, it's fixed. That's less money flowing in so i'm curious to see how that impacts the um the date at which the it is projected that it will you know run out of the i could say one more thing on the social security trust fund and the running out really in terms of fiscal challenges you're right pat in terms of fiscal challenges for the country healthcare costs are actually much more important and much more much worse problem and um and part of the, the really one of the big best best arguments against expanding Social Security is simply that we'll need that tax revenue revenue on potentially enrich people for uh, healthcare costs going forward. So and uh, and that, by healthcare that, that we mean the, including the Medicare costs, the costs we're already paying, not 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 even yeah. not 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 even expansions. Um, exactly. Um, what, let's let's talk about a little bit about uh, work. Uh, not in retirement, I guess, but at what was conventionally considered retirement age. Um, uh, uh, we have a question from Lynn who who asks, you know, ageism was already a problem for older workers. Uh, I believe it will be amplified to a new level because employers won't want to deal with a high risk population anymore. Uh, do we have any thoughts on this and sort of how uh, ageism operates and may be a challenge in terms of setting people up for retirement. Yeah, I have some thoughts. Um, Definitely. I think ageism is one of those things that is, has become a huge problem in the workforce and that it becomes very hard for people to find jobs again when they lose their jobs in their late fifties, or early sixties. It's a, it's a real problem. And that makes it much harder for people to retire with confidence because in a lot of cases, they would be so much better off working until they're, you know, 68 or 70, tapping Social Security later, getting a bigger check. So it, it, it's a huge issue. Um, I'm not sure if um, this virus um, is, is really the... It, I'm not sure if that's a fuel for age discrimination as much as a lot of older people won't want to go out to work or won't feel safe going out to work for a little while. Um, what I'm more worried about in terms of retirement and age discrimination is that the recession that we're going through right now is going to create a bunch of job losses and automation and other changes in the economy that are going to put millions of um older workers out of work and then put them in a situation in 20 in next year or the, in the following year where they're going to be looking for work and they can't find it. And then that, then they have to tap social security early and they have to adjust to a much lower standard of living in retirement. That's yeah, my real concern. Yeah. I mean, Ben, you've done really good stories about sort of the impact of tapping social security early and you know how much more you can sort of add to your retirement pot if you can just, you know, string it out as long as possible. So we may have a huge wave of people who just have to tap it early, giving up that crucial increase in income that they might have gotten if they could hold off for like five or seven years. 
Yeah. You, you know, it, it also strikes me, and I, I, I learned this a little bit from, from your story, Ben, that, um, you know, when people uh, are looking for work and they're having trouble finding jobs, it seems like one of the things about this economy is that the jobs that are available, or at least traditionally have been available, are maybe some of the ones that are the most dangerous for older people to take. Um, <laughs> You know, in that they may be service, they may be service sector jobs um, that uh, that 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 require a lot of face to face contact. Yeah, right. It's um, you know, I, I know Amazon is hiring in their warehouses, and I know that. Um, uh, but it really, it, it, older people are taking a risk when they go to the grocery store. Um, uh, just. It, the other thing that's going on is is that we've seen if you look at the Nasdaq, so the tech stocks, they they're basically haven't lost any money this year. We, we're we're seeing this acceleration of technological change happening through this crisis, where everything's moving online, and that d potentially disadvantages older workers who feel less comfortable with tech tech tools. That is not always true. A lot of older people are feel quite comfortable with technology, but. If you don't feel comfortable with technology, or, um, that makes it harder to get a to get a job these days. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Older employees are more expensive, and as you know, in medical costs and salary, and as increased financial pressure comes on, they're an easier target. Right. In terms right. Of well, and also, I mean, I I, I just think um, even. Even besides uh, those issues, they just have to fight. They have to fight the perception that all these things will be true of them. That they won't. That right. they won't want to do this, and and uh, uh, you, you know, they, uh, and that and that they won't be as comfortable with these tech tools. Or uh, it may just be that the, you know, that the new companies that are starting up, they're all young people who've just gotten out of college, and it just wouldn't have occurred to them to like even you know uh, meet any older older people who might work for them. And, and you do just have like real straight up age discrimination. Sure. Um, uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about younger people. Uh, do we know um, uh, as maybe kind of a, a barometer of financial distress, uh, are, have we seen any young people, uh, this is a question, this is actually a question uh, from uh, Elena. Uh, have we seen any young people starting to tap their retirement funds uh, early or prematurely? Not, not yet. Not seen. Not, um, yeah, not yet. Uh, it suggests um, like for young people who are in target date funds, like two percent touch their money. I saw one number. Um, I, luckily, it seems like the crisis hit very quickly, um, and people didn't have time to react. And that was actually a good thing because um, if they had sold at that moment at the bottom, they would be really regretting it right now because stocks have come back up. What do we make of that? That's been a really remarkable thing. I mean, we had um, a 2008 level event in financial markets. I, I was uh, covering it firsthand um, and I would have, uh, you know, been uh, unsurprised if stocks had uh, stayed down there. Um, uh, but in fact, a lot of those losses uh, were pretty quickly eliminated. I think we're. I, I think the S and P now is down about eleven uh, percent for the year, which, you know, you don't love to see it. But if you're in a diversified um, 401k plan or something like that, it doesn't make you afraid to open your statement or anything, because um, that maybe because maybe maybe you're down down six percent. I mean, just as. Uh, I know it's hard to explain the stock market, but just as um, you know, markets reporters and reporters on on financial assets, what, what do we what do we make of the surprisingly uh, quick recovery in asset prices, even as we're staring down the barrel of a recession? I wouldn't really comment on asset prices, but I would comment on what that says about the futility of market timing. Mm -hmm. um, and trying to call the bottom, and I mean, a lot of people in two eight that were really hurt permanently in terms of their, you know, net worth were those who panicked and sold and then thought they could get back in at a better mm -hmm. level. Because when you're trying to market time and you sell, and you've also got that second part, which is when do I get in? And the fact is right. a lot of people did not get in again until the market had already run up tremendously. Mm -hmm. So um, I would just sort of use that as a, as a backdrop to the volatility. Um, uh, Suzanne, you wrote a really uh, 
sharp article for us a couple months ago before the market had dropped um, so dramatically uh, about, you know, should you buy the dip? And I, I think like some of the things that you're saying, it kind of goes the other way too. It's kind of hard to, it's, it's kind of hard. Sometimes when you see things drop, people say, well, okay, sh should I be shoveling more money in? Uh, is this a, is this an opportunistic time for me to buy? Uh, I, uh, what, what, what do you make of those arguments? Um, it, it's a very really depends on your circumstances. Um, I think you should have a smart plan and stick to it. And like Ben mentioned earlier, not make any dramatic moves. I think you know when you talk about buying on the dip. There's buying on the dip, and then there's that really uh evocative language about catching a falling knife you know mm -hmm. having the market drop and keep dropping um so i i'm not a huge fan of of buying the dip um i'm more of a fan of dollar cost averaging which has its critics as well but if, if you feel that if you really think the market is a bargain now i personally would get in slowly over time in a measured fashion. I mean, I think one of the things is that for most people, uh, they're, they're always uh, doing that. I mean, you mentioned dollar cost averaging. Can you just talk about what that is? And, uh, and then- Oh, just deploying your money, basically deploying your money, money steadily over time so that you're not always buying at the top and you're not you know, buying at the bottom. You're sort of averaging out your costs over time. So right, it's sort of- right out your your the price that you're paying if you're you know buying the index right. or something right um, I, I know i know there's a lot of debate over whether that's better than doing lump sum investing um right. uh, actually i don't even think there's really a debate i i think like almost every economist would say that you might as well just do lump sum investing um yeah. if you add a lump right. sum but most people we dollar cost average all the time because we right. don't have a lump sum. we get a paycheck and right. And and that does have the effect of kind of we're always kind of dip buying, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, because you know. We, like you said, in our story, we talked about how you know you are regularly buying into the market. You're regularly buying the dip right now. If you just kept contributing to your four hundred one k, right? You hope the company match and stuff like that. So if you're you're already buying the dip without doing anything, mm -hmm. so decide to do that with your taxable money, your basically double dipping on your thing. Um, so we talked a little bit about the fact that it doesn't seem like uh, younger people are taking money out yet, um, but there have been some changes in the retirement system in response to this crisis, right? Um, that uh, yeah, have made some of that money that's supposed to be locked up a little less locked. Can we, can we, can we talk about what's happening there? Yeah, so uh, the CARES Act, which is, uh, <coughs> The, these these this huge um, retirement or sorry the coronavirus bills that have come through they've changed the rules a little bit. Um, uh, one thing is that required minimum distributions, which is a requirement that people in their early seventies and older have to take money out of IRAs and four hundred one ks, that is suspended for twenty twenty. So you, a lot of people will not have to take money out, which which might this might be an inconvenient time to take money out if you don't want to to sell at the bottom. Um, uh, but the other thing that they've done is made it much easier to tap money in four hundred one ks if you're younger, uh, and uh, you basically can take a hundred thousand dollars out without a penalty paying a penalty. Um, you will have to pay taxes on that because remember any money in a 401, traditional 401k or a, a traditional IRA, that's tax deferred money, meaning you didn't put up money, didn't pay taxes on it when you put it in. So you have to pay taxes on it when it comes out, but that Congress is also giving people time, basically three years to pay those taxes. So it, it is, there, there's also some provisions that allow you to borrow more money from 401ks now. Um, so it is a advantageous time to tap money in your 401k, but of course you're going to be hurting yourself later down the road. Um, and uh, I actually do wonder with all these millions of people, 26 million people filing for jobless claims, how many of these people are going to need to tap their 401k or retirement, retirement accounts um, going forward later this year, maybe. So you think there's a wave to come? Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. 
although I point out that like a lot of people who have been laid off have been sort of service workers, which is you know, that's not an industry where you necessarily see a lot of 401ks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, unfortunately, a lot of those people didn't have retirement plans to begin with. Well, um, Suzanne, maybe you can talk a little bit about like, so if I'm actually uh, looking at uh, you, you uh, I, you're working on a story about this right now. If um, and I, I won't put you on the spot by telling you what, what have you found out yet. But 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 yeah. if we could just kind of talk generally about how um, how to think about um, what money to tap um, and priorities in an emergency like this. I mean, I think. Um, a lot of people are in a new situation today, maybe one they hadn't thought they'd be in, where they, um, it, you know, they may be thinking about uh, which bills to prioritize, but they also just may be thinking about what um, what can they set aside right now, what can they give up so that they can have a bit of a cushion. Um, where, uh, if I'm looking at the student loan bills I have to pay, the college tuition bills I have to pay for my kids, um, and my income is a little less right now, or I'm anticipating that there's a risk, how should I think about the possibility of um, either pulling back on my current savings or tapping, tapping that savings? Yeah, I mean, the key right now, obviously, is Having some financial flexibility um, and trying to sort of build that into your um, financial picture. Um, in terms of uh, student loans, you know, obviously you can defer student loans. Many of them are. Um, that's sort of a easy decision, I think. Although, like anything, that can snowball over over time. Um, there's a lot of issues out now. Um, offers of like mortgage forbearance and such, which, um, I mean, if you have to do that, you have to do it, but it's, um, it's a dangerous road to go down, I think, in a way, because the interest, you don't have to pay it, but it is still growing. And you're sort of looking toward larger payments down the line, and you don't know if your income will have sort of recovered or will be the same. So I would look at issues like, I, I wonder if, um, you know, we think of CDs as sort of sacrosanct, say, you know, we don't like touch them. And there are definitely penalties for early withdrawal on CDs, but they're really not that huge. So if you have a CD and you need money, I mean, you might pay the, the amount you're going to pay. The early withdrawal payments are just really not that horrible. I think I would sacrifice um, that little bit of interest on the CD to get that level of flexibility or just another area is just sort of looking at your life a lot of us don't really know what our budget is and there's something that financial planners talk a lot about about lifestyle creep and it's just you know i see it in my life you know i used to go to a crummy gym i upgraded to a much nicer one um it's in the car you drive it's sort of you get used to spending at a higher level as your income rises so sort of being more cognizant of what is extra um, or what is lifestyle creep in your budget um, mm -hmm. is a really I mean, it's very basic, but um, it's a good thing to sort of look at now and sort of recalibrate and see what your, in, your absolute necessities are in terms of what bills you have to pay and what you could put off. What do we what do we think about? Uh, I'll just ask about something that uh, I'm looking down the barrel at. I'm uh, you know if I if I can if I can retire when I want to, I'm a countable number years of years away from retirement. Um, uh, and, but I also have uh, uh, kids' college tuition um, to look forward to you uh, to uh, pretty pretty much in those times. So I have at a time of real economic turbulence and doubt. I'm both entering my peak savings years. I'm almost at the at the time when I could start doing catch-up contributions to my 401k. And that's going to happen right in the teeth of uh, presumably me writing some checks to some universities. Um, uh, I think for a lot of people, this is where the retirement versus current consumption, if you want to call that for college, consumption uh, question 
really meets the road. How do, how do I prioritize uh, uh, co college costs and uh, retirement costs? I personally would put your retirement first um, mm -hmm. because your children may be able to get loans. Um, if something happens to your income, you may be able to negotiate more of a financial aid package than you could have previously if your income has dropped a lot. And colleges may be more flexible than they they used to be, given given what's going on and all the uncertainty. And mm -hmm. I just that you know your kid can also take on debt and such. But you, you know, you need to put that money toward your retirement um, because you're not going to be able to sort of make that up later in life. So I'm yeah. I'm a fan of favoring your own retirement over your kid's college education. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, I'm, I'm kind of balancing, like, I want to make sure it's adequate. I also think uh, a lot of people feel like uh, their, their kids are, uh, this is why, this is why I worked. <laughs> um, and this is like what I'm supposed to do. Um, but I, I do wonder if a lot of people are going to be um, balancing, balancing the costs and maybe taking a more gimlet eye at some of these college costs, you know, especially if, um, the college I'm sending my kid to uh, is planning to do a year of online classes before I get there. Um, I'm I, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure. Uh, you know, uh, it, it it's going to change it's going to change the cal the calculus I think for some people about what they're paying for, um, and maybe the sensibility of you know uh, filling in some credits. Uh, at a at a lower cost school nearby for a lot of people, especially if your kid's still going to be in the house that semester anyway. <laughs> I should add is I don't want to I don't know if I sounded too flip about your child child taking on debt because that oh, is no, no. a huge student on so many people today. Obviously, student loan debt is following people, you know, into late in their life. So I mean, to be able to start your kid out in this tough environment without having a huge cloud of debt over their head is an enormous gift. Yeah. I mean, I, I think uh, it, it's, it's a tricky issue and actually I'm, but I'm glad you raised it because um, I think one thing uh, that's come up, this is a little bit outside of retirement, but I, th I think one of the things that we've seen is that retirement is part of kind of a, a uh, it's just one step in a life of financial planning. And one thing that's been a real retirement savings blocker for a lot of people has been this overhang of student debt. Um, uh, what's your sense, just looking at the political winds, if anything is going to change there with uh, with, with student debt? Um, are, are we uh, are we are we seeing any movement on on that? I don't actually know, although I would think we might. It's such a pressing issue, and um, it's affecting people's ability. It's affecting retirement. Um, I don't actually know. Ben, do you know? Um, I think there are provisions actually in these, uh, I think in the CARES Act that uh, uh, relax some some of the student loan payments or requirements uh, right now. I'm not sure the exact details. So that's at least some movement. Um, at least something got through Congress that affected, uh, it, it slightly improved the situation. Um, uh, certainly, if a Democrat, if Joe Biden wins, um, there will be a lot of pressure on him to do something about student loans. I'm not sure that um, this is an issue that Trump has really uh, spent any time on at all. But um, I, we have time for uh, one more question. I'll, I'll bring in one from uh, from online from Harris, uh, who asks if we can incorporate uh, housing wealth uh, in, into this conversation, which I. I I think is an interesting question. I think it it sort of gets to, uh, you know, housing wealth has been actually a bedrock of a lot of people's retirement for a lot of years. Um, how how does how does housing wealth generally fit into um, people's ability to retire? What, what what do we know about housing wealth and its ability to grow retirement assets? Yeah. So. Um what I know about it is that if you really think about the, the bottom 90% of the American pu public, um, their wealth is basically housing wealth. That is basically the wealth that they have. And, and really the top 10%, like they own 90% of the stocks. So 
um, when we talk about the stock market, we're really talking about the top 10%. So housing wealth is incredibly important, but it the problem is it's not liquid. There's no good way to tap it. And so I think one of the lessons for me from a crisis like this is, is looking at some of the statistics on how much of American wealth is liquid, how much can people tap in a moment like this. It's really dangerously low. So many families, they might have retirement wealth in a 401k that they would have to pay a penalty to get. They, they'll have money in their house, but they're not going to sell their house or it's going to, it might be hard to get a home equity loan right now. Um, so, uh, one of the big questions in retirement circles is how much can we, uh, you know, help retirees tap their housing wealth, um, but um, through like reverse mortgages. And my understanding is reverse mortgages have been improved a little bit in the last few years in terms of there's been some regulations that have come along, but there are some heavy fees that are associated with it as well. And um, there's a lot of education that you have to put yourself through to, to make sure you're comfortable with putting a reverse mortgage on your home where um, you're basically tapping that wealth because a lot of people feel like it is their last line of defense. It is the last um, last thing that you don't you you need a place to live, right? right. Um, so so I think it, I you know I, I, when I think about housing, I think about both the fact that it re- so much of our wealth is in house housing is really an exposure because we don't have enough emergency savings. But I also think it could be a way that people could get through retirement and make sure that they don't run out of money if it was leveraged correctly. Yeah. I think that's a great note to end on. Um, well, uh, I just want to um, thank everybody for uh, joining us. Um, I, I hope we'll do this again sometime. Uh, maybe next time I'll be able to have gotten a haircut. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so we're we're looking forward to uh, better uh, and more open days when we can we can all uh, when the three of us can all get together and uh, and and when and when you uh, out there can do that with with your families as well. Um, for ongoing COVID nineteen coverage and other stories, uh, follow Bloomberg Business Week on Twitter at 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 bw. That's the uh, Twitter handle and visit. Uh, www.bloomberg.com slash businessweek. Uh, you can also listen to uh, Bloomberg Business Week on Bloomberg Radio and YouTube uh, from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time daily. Uh, thank you again so much for uh, joining us uh, and uh, stay safe out there. Wash your hands. Uh, observe social distance.